Oh, it's an epic orchestral introduction for what is going to be an epic interview. I can promise you that. We've already got comments coming in. Uh, people people saying uh, it's perfect timing. It absolutely is perfect timing. Tim, I've just seen your comment. I, I hope you're bracing yourself here, mate. Tim says, I'm going to be triggered if you're not smoking a cigar. It upsets me not seeing all the comments with people having a whinge about you smoking. Yes, I know, Tim. I'm with you. I'm with you. But uh, sadly, this is uh, how I've had to go. Um, dissolved Parliament. Not quite sure what that's about, Ross. Uh, you feel free to explain and uh, I'll have a read. Behold, Topher Field and Peter Ridd. Well, look, Peter Ridd is obviously the subject matter expert of the two of us. I'm just here to pick his brain and try and navigate and find uh, the things that we really, lay persons like myself and most uh, of the viewers, I know there's a few experts among you as well, um, we are going to have a fun time learning. We are going to get schooled today. But before we get to that, very quickly, if you haven't yet uh, booked your tickets to one of the showings of Battleground Melbourne, some of the showings are close to selling out. The premiere, uh, there were 450 tickets available to the public. We've got only about 100 of them left. So if you are planning on coming to the premiere, that's going to sell out sometime this week. So jump onto my uh, Facebook page. At the very, very top of the Facebook page, you'll find a thread there, uh, a post pinned to the top that has all of the links for all of the sessions. Or you can go to topherfield.net. I'll type that in. Uh, topherfield.net. Why is my cask bar doing that? Uh, yeah, topherfield.net. That should pop up wherever you're watching. That'll pop up now for you. And um, yes, you need to book your tickets now if you're planning on coming along, which I hope you are because it is going to be one of those sort of unforgettable experiences. It's not about watching it. You can watch Battleground Melbourne for free at battlegroundmelbourne.com. It's completely free. It was crowdfunded. It was paid for by you guys. It was written by you guys. I just had the privilege of telling your story. So it is, is and always will be free to watch. But if you want to be in that room, if you want to have that experience of sitting there with literally hundreds of other uh, freedom fighters and, and people that have shared your journey, then you need to be at the premiere on the 23rd of August at Rivoli. Get your tickets at uh, toferfield.net. Right. Uh, people are asking, what am I drinking tonight? Um, sadly, not whiskey. Whiskey for me is like a whiskey and cigars thing. I, I do a little bit of whiskey outside of that, but really not. Um, so what I've actually grabbed, just out of curiosity, never had it before. Uh, it's called Spiwa. Uh, let me try and get the light to not reflect off that. It's a Shiraz Cab Sav. Um, I made the mistake of brushing my teeth just before the show. I just had that fuzzy, where I had like chicken parm with lots of cheese on it. I was like, no, I'm brushing my teeth. So when I had my first sip of this wine, it tasted suspiciously like toothpaste. So I'm gonna give my palate a couple of minutes to cleanse. I've got some black tea. Uh, thank you, Andrew, that's very kind. And uh, I'm gonna cleanse the palate with some black tea before I get back to the wine. Um, <laughs> Tim says, no whiskey or cigars. I'm starting to wonder if you are a deep fake. I wouldn't be a very deep fake without the whiskey and cigars. Uh, Aaron's going to be at the premiere. I'm looking forward to seeing you, mate, especially out of everybody. I'm super looking forward to seeing you. Uh, and that's going to be a great, great day. Okay. Uh, Melissa is going to be at the Geelong one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you guys so much. The other big piece of news is I'm going to be in Sydney twice in the next month or next couple of months. Once is on the 25th of August, two days after the premiere down, premiere down here in Melbourne. I'm doing a flying visit up to Sydney to participate in the Freedom Summit that Reignite Democracy Australia is putting on. So go to the Reignite Democracy website, get yourself a ticket if you're in Sydney to that. We just had one in Melbourne. It was an absolutely epic day or epic uh, night. Amazing speakers. Uh, they've asked me to open once again. Uh, I'm sort of the, the crowd warm up. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. It's a really, really good night. If you're in Sydney, make sure you get to that. And I've just been announced as one of the keynote speakers for the upcoming CPAC conference in Sydney, October 1st and 2nd. That's along with the likes of Nigel Farage, uh, Zuby is coming over, uh, the Honourable Amanda Stoker, Senator Jacinta Price, and, and so many others. So I'm a keynote on the um, Sunday afternoon, but there's just a, it's a fantastic lineup. It's going to be an incredible two days. There's going to be a thousand people at Luna Park in Sydney for that. So go to the CPAC Australia website to get tickets for that. Okay. I think that's all the news. I think, I think we can just wipe all of that off the desk. It's done. It's out of the way. I'm going to take a deep breath. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, tooth, toothpaste flavored wine does not, does not, it's no, it's not good. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to finally have a guest that I've been thinking about having for a very long time and never reached out. Always kind of thought he's not going to know who I am. He's not going to want to talk to me. 
uh, you know, what's in it for him? Why would he even want to do that? And I finally reached out and uh, to my surprise, he just got back in touch and said, hey, yeah, let's let's do this. So, and the timing could not be better with the report that came out today, but you know what? I'm not going to steal his thunder. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, former professor, uh, Peter Ridd, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks, Topa. Well, look, thank you so much for coming. And thank you for saying yes. Uh, I do appreciate that. It's always a little bit nerve wracking when you're asking, you know, people that don't know you and you don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just honoured when anybody wants to listen to <laughs> what I'm, I'm saying. So my standards well, are not that high, but I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I can I can take it. I can take it. Look. The reality is, though, you're not wrong. Like, there is this weird this weird situation that's unfolded around you where there are a lot of media and a lot of academia that would just like to pretend that you don't exist. Um, is well, Look, we'll dive into all the whole the, the court case, the whole James Cook University thing. I'm sure we're going to end up talking about that a little bit later on. But in a nutshell, is... Is this a common problem? Do you think that there are a whole lot of Peter Rids that maybe didn't get the amount of coverage that you got in Australia or, or around the world who are just being sidelined and science, uh, silenced and pushed out of the debate? Is, is this a common problem or is it pretty unique? I think it is a common problem. I mean, it's it's not common in the sense that there are thousands uh, sure. in my my but but there would certainly be dozens and they'd have important things that they want to say yeah. Um, they wouldn't be like me in the sense that they've ended up being fired because you would know about that. They yeah, you wouldn't yeah. know about all of those. Um, but it's the self-censoring that goes on. People mm. know what's going to happen. I mean, I knew what was going to happen to me eventually. I just didn't know when it was going to happen. Uh, yeah. So, yes, and that's why it's a problem. Yeah. No, look, I, you, I, I actually already know of a few other examples. It was a slightly, um, not a loaded question, but it was a, you know, a disingenuous question. It's, it is it is a, a very serious problem and we'll get into the reasons behind it a little bit later on. But the big news from today, we just had this new report came out. It actually was covered. I believe the Australian gave it a little bit of coverage. Um, yep. Not sure. There may have been some other outlets as well. But for those that missed it, can you actually, let's start with this because there will be some people watching that don't actually know what you do and who you are. Can you briefly explain what is it that you do and then this new report, what's its significance? Uh, I'm a scientist. I've worked on the Great Barrier Reef since 1984. I'm a physicist by training, but we worked on the physical oceanography, the movement of water, sediment, all the basic things which you need to understand to understand the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Uh, and um, over many years, we, we worked on many things, and I eventually came to the conclusion that the reef was fine and that there were quality assurance problems with in the institutions and then that ultimately led me to be fired because I spoke my mind on that. When it comes to this new data, um, essentially the Australian Institute of Marine Science, which is called AIMS, um, yeah. every year surveys around about 100 uh, reefs to look at how much coral there is on those reefs. And it just so happens they've been doing that since 1986, and this year their data shows that the reef is a record high coral cover, um, which by any standards is a fairly remarkable result, given that we've been told that, you know, half the coral has died. We've had four bleaching events since 2016. Remember, corals are slow-growing creatures. They can't mm, just sort mm. of grow like grass. So mm. how can it possibly be true that we've lost so much coral when we've now got record high coral? So i'm I'm gonna play the layman here the play, play sort of the dumb which is is true it's it's method acting i'm I'm playing what I am um but but let me ask you a couple of dumb questions here because there's a few things that struck me I, I read your post about it um and actually uh, props to all the people when I reposted um Peter's post about the Ames survey onto my Facebook a bunch of you all jumped on very quickly and said oh well see the 450 million that was given to to the reef it must have worked like obviously that's uh you know so so well played well played um but it it, it seems to me number one they're surveying 100 reefs it's my understanding that they do that from a plane what's the methodology that they actually use um no they don't do this from a plane there are certainly okay. some they do bleaching from a plane and Jennifer Marahas is uh, quite rightly pointed out that that's got huge problems. Um, mm. This is actually surveyed by a diver, and this, there, okay. there are there are there are even problems with this too. Um, but it, they, they essentially circle around the reef, 
Um, yeah. And they do a, a subjective judgment every about 100 to 200 meters. They say the coral cover is, looks about this much. And then they add that up for the reef and then they move on to the next reef. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how they do it. Um, in my view, the, the data is useful. It's certainly got a fair bit of noise in it in terms mm. of the general accuracy, but you can certainly see changes in it. So, for example, if a big cyclone goes through, you can see the coral collapse, not just on one mm. reef, but on all yeah, the reefs where, where it happened. If mm. you have um, big crown of thorns starfish outbreak, you can see mm. the collapse. And then you also see the nice gentle increase. So mm. I think it is a, a very useful data set. Um, you certainly can't look at very small percentages of changes that there's too much sure. noise sure. but we are so much higher than anything we've seen before mm. um that there is absolutely no doubt we've got more coral on the reef in my view well that's this is what the data says um yeah. ever since 1986 which so, is great isn't it i mean it, this should be amazing. we, we should amazing. be we should be you know ringing the church bells we should be giving the kids a, a, a day off school, we should be having a beer, we should be doing all the things because our Great Barrier Reef is, has been shown by the Australian Institute of Marine Science, no less, mm. to be at record high brilliance. Mm. Mm. So that was today's news, but this is not a new topic. This, this has been going on for quite some time. And I think one of the things that, that a lot of people may not fully appreciate is just how serious or the the how serious the implications of reef health are because the health of the reef is being used to le leverage policy in other areas we're talking about queensland farmers uh, talking about what's allowed to happen in terms of tourism or, or getting coal or other things in and out from behind that reef trade through the reef etc can you can we just widen our view a little bit Give us some idea of why why this battle over whether or not the information on the reef is accurate is actually so important. Well, there, there are two reasons. One is the economic reason for North Queensland, where I am. But I'm yeah. going to go to the bigger, the bigger concern, and that is sure. that it's unbelievable how many children, because remember, they, they've been indoctrinated at school that the reef is completely kaput, right? Mm -hmm. And they are a lot of them are actually in genuine depression. They are grieving yeah. about the fact that the reef is gone. It's indicative of all sorts of problems with the rest of the world, that the, the world is just going to the dogs. Um, there's no point in having children because none of it's going to be worth living. That is the main reason why we've got to get over this ridiculous idea that the reef is somehow dead. And this yeah. related statistics fortuitously has come at a very good time. Mm. All right, so that's the main reason. The, 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 but for North Queensland, it, it really is a nuts and bolts issue for us because every single industry in North Queensland is affected by uh, regulations about the reef or the bad news about the reef. So obviously the tourist industry, you talk to the tourist people and they go on and on. Oh, you know, everybody thinks the reef is dying. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to want to come from overseas, mm -hmm. uh, fly over Phuket, fly over the reefs in Israel and mm -hmm. go to the Great Barrier Reef, which is completely kaput, right? Why would you mm -hmm. do that? Then you've got the agricultural industries. They've been told, and they've got huge regulations against them now. They've got to reduce uh, sediment runoff. They've got to reduce fertilizer. I'll talk about that a little bit later if you want. Mm. And mm. they've got to reduce fertilizer. And we've seen mm. in what, what happened in Sri Lanka, what's going to happen in, um, in Holland, what's going to happen in, in Canada when you go. reduce your fertilizer. Mm. Where's the food going to come from, guys? Mm -hmm. And then there's a the fishing industry, which has already been em emasculated. It's been mm -hmm. halved in size already. And the Queensland government is essentially uh, aiming to almost close down the mackerel fisheries, almost close down the tiger prawn fishery. Um, they are really on their last legs due to regulations. Yeah. This, is, this I think, was, was the eye-opener for me was some years ago when I, I came to understand that the Great Barrier Reef was being used as the reason why so many other things needed to be done. And that really, in my mind, escalated the Great Barrier Reef controversy, I'll, I'll simply call it that, to right alongside the Murray-Darling Basin mismanagement, which for me has been the subject that I've actually been passionately banging on about for years. Yeah. Um, and, and I've, I've stated in the past that that's probably the biggest uh, misinformation bad, example of bad science within Australia. Well, the Great Barrier Reef is technically just offshore of Australia, but I, I would give it a, a position alongside the, the Murray-Darling Basin. 
in both the seriousness of the misconduct scientifically, but also the seriousness of the implications of, of what it means. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely. I'm interested you, you say about Murray Darling because I also uh, occasionally quote the Murray Darling or the bad science about the Murray Darling as exactly the same problem. Mm. Um, okay. You've got untrustworthy science institutions who are utterly misleading, mm -hmm. uh, pretending they're doing science when they're not, mm -hmm and damaging an industry. So, I mean, you've got the situation in the Murray-Darling where the scientists are pretending that the lower lake, what is it, Lake Alexandrina, I forget yep, the name, yep, um, is supposedly a freshwater system, even though the barrages went in, what, in the 1920s or 30, to yep. deliberately make it. And it was originally an estuarine system. And they, yep. I mean, it's just yep. staggering that you have a thing as big as that lake and you're pretending it, that it's a freshwater lake when it's clearly not. Now. I had Professor Gell on last week, and unfortunately, he had some really serious connection issues, and we never really got to the heart of it. But he talked a little bit about the diatoms and the science and, and what he researches. Yeah. But even putting aside his work, we have so much historical data about the types yeah. of fish that were being caught, about people yeah. trying to drink the water uh, inside those lakes at different times. It clearly was estuarine, sometimes salty, sometimes fresh. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, if scientists can get away with you know, such a scam of, you know, mm -hmm. the, the proportions of the size of a huge lake, um, <laughs> you know, they can get away with a lot. So in the, on the Great Barrier Reef, for example, um, the, the, the farmers are told that they've got to reduce pesticides. Now, of course, they want to reduce pesticides. It, it costs money. It, it's, it's bad for the local environment, but does it affect the Great Barrier Reef? When you actually look at the measurements, when they go out to the Great mm -hmm. Barrier Reef to measure the pesticide concentrations, remember, the reef is a long way offshore. Mm -hmm. They're in such low concentrations that they are utterly, totally undetectable, even with the most ultra, ultra sensitive equipment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can you be killing the reef when there's nothing out there? I, I, I have uh, a, a very close associate of mine who's a very keen uh, scuba diver, lives in Queensland and got very cross with me when I questioned the idea that the reef was dying and that the fertilizer wasn't causing some kind of a reef apocalypse. And um, yeah, it, it was it was just this really interesting, a, a very rational human being, but their reaction to what I said was very visceral. It wasn't an intellectual reaction. It was a it was an emotional um, and, and quite cross reaction. It was a how dare you suggest. Uh, it was just this really interesting thing. So where is that information? Actually, sorry, before I ask the follow up question, um, Malcolm, uh, welcome. Uh, as far as I know, this is the first of my slow chats that you've watched. Uh, Malcolm and I actually caught up uh, a couple of times recently. We were just at the uh, Libertarian Society conference in Sydney a couple of weekends ago, where Malcolm uh, watched Battleground Melbourne and wrote a very, very kind review about Battleground Melbourne, saying it's one of the greatest films that he's ever watched. So thank you. That's very kind, Malcolm. Uh, and I appreciate you tuning in. Obviously, he's tuning in for you, Peter, not for me. He's never tuned in to me before. So uh, it must be the, the draw card. And he says, uh, Peter is a good man on an important subject. I look forward to the rest of this chat. Well, it's nice to have you, Malcolm. So where are people getting this idea from that the reef is being killed by these fertilisers if it can be shown so easily in the data that it just can't be the case? Well, uh, it, exactly. Well, of course, the, the, the problem that the average sensible person has is that they believe that the reef is dead or almost dead and that the science institutions are trustworthy. Yeah. So I then come along or you go along and say, well, actually, all this data shows that this is untrue. Mm. Now, that's a problem because the person has got two choices. They can keep believing that the reef is dying or mm -hmm. they now believe that, well, maybe the reef isn't dying. But the corollary of that is that, therefore, the institutions are utterly untrustworthy. Yeah. And that is just such a horrible, horrible thought. No, don't want to. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe these institutions haven't been telling. I've been told since I was five years old, you can trust the science. You, and that is the problem. That's the problem yeah. we've got. That essentially yeah. you, you're, um, by saying that these guys are wrong, you are getting yourself into a problem that you look awfully like a conspiracy theorist. Even though you just, this is the data. Yeah. This is yeah. their data. It's not even my yeah. data that's showing it. Look, yeah. I've been called a conspiracy theorist so many times now. I've just decided that I am one. I've, I've just I've just made the decision. You know what? Fine. You can call me that. Um, but, you know, you know, the most common, the most frequent times that I've been wrong have been when I've rejected the conspiracy theory. I don't jump onto every conspiracy theory. There's a lot that I reject. But recently, and I'll give you one example, I rejected the conspiracy theory that the coronavirus came from the lab in Wuhan. 
It just seemed like an unnecessary distraction, possibly with some racist overtones. And why couldn't it have come from a bat? We know that previous viruses have. So I went, guys, knock it off. Get out of here. It's just that's just tinfoil hat stuff. Well, it turns out it's almost certainly true. I've been yeah. wrong more often rejecting conspiracy theories than I have when I've actually given them a, a fair hearing. Yeah, I I don't like to use the word. I mean, I, I go along with that completely, by the way. Mm. Um, mm. But they're not really conspiracies in the normal way that people think of them. A conspiracy is where a group of people in a dark room, people smoking cigars, taper. Mm. Um, they <laughs> decide, <laughs> yeah, they decide what they're going to do to the poor people. And yeah, there is a little bit of that going on, but mostly what's going on is it's sort of a, a cultural, I call it maybe a cultural conspiracy that all these scientists are self-selecting. They've gone mm -hmm. into environmental sciences because they love the reef, which by the way is not why I went into studying the reef. I'm a physicist. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and then they just talk to each other. There are financial incentives. We have the peer review system, which automatically mm -hmm. chucks out people um, that don't go along with it. And the conspiracy mm. forms, even though nobody's actually doing anything sort of overtly, deliberately bad, but it, it has the same effect as being a mm -hmm. conspiracy. So, yeah, there is a, a, a quasi conspiracy working here. And the, the thing that opened my mind to this was actually, and I, I did warn you, Peter, before, and I said, this is going to come up. I know this book is going to come up. Um, this book here, it came up. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to come up, but it did when I was chatting with Professor Ian uh, Plymer. And uh, then I was like, you know, you know what? I need to keep this handy because this is going to be a book that I'm going to be referencing a lot. Science and yep. Public Policy, The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Science by Professor Ainsley Keller from the University of Tasmania. This completely altered how I view the entire world, not just environmental sciences, because what it does is it lays out in very calm, rational terms how a good, sincere person who is absolutely convinced that they are doing the right thing will falsify data or use data that they know isn't reliable and, and not apply the level of rigor that they should because they're doing it for the right reasons in their mind. Agreed. It's the last one that's the most uh, likely where they're not applying the right amount of rigor. Very mm. few, I mean, I do know of cases where I think the data has been fudged, but almost all my, say, scientific opposition, mm. they're doing it for the, they, they think they're doing it for the right reasons. They think they're doing yes. good science, but I think they're not doing yeah. it uh, rigorously enough. So, mm. you know, I can't actually uh, criticise the, uh, the motivation of these people, yeah, the but they're still getting it badly wrong. And it's because we don't have the systems to make sure the group's Form. So the fundamental problem is that we have horrific groupthink and it's mm. it's inevitable that it will form because every system which we've got, especially peer review, will make those groups form and we've got to mm. stop that somehow. Yeah, well, peer review has been a, been a real problem. We, we saw in the so-called climate gate email uh, leaks that came out where uh, there was the appearance and obviously you know, the people being you know, quoted in those emails have their own version on, on how it should be interpreted and what they were saying, etc., but it certainly gives rise to the appearance that the peer review process was being used, as, uh, as someone said in my comments a minute ago, as, as PAL review, as a form of gatekeeping for, for approved opinions. My question for you, though, is, is there a better way? If, if you don't have, like, how do you try and get science to be rigorous and properly checked? What process could you have that is going to ensure that science is being tested properly other than something like a peer review? Well, firstly, let's uh, remember that in the last 15 years that a lot of the science major institutions have been talking about a thing called the replication crisis, where we now know yes. that about half of the peer-reviewed literature is wrong. Ah. So this is now well known. So the question is, what do you do about it? Mm. Now, we can first look at what industry does about it, because industry has been using science and the military has been using science for a long time. What do they do? What does the military do to check a weapon works, right? They don't just... I will believe the company and then go mm. off to war, mm. though there have been some pretty bad occasions where that's what they have done. It's been a disaster. Generally speaking, what they'll do is they will test it and they will test it and they will test it. Mm -hmm. Does the bomb explode? Does the rifle work or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, industry does something similar. So, for example, a big drug company that might be going to test whether some university research that supposedly says a particular um a chemical cures cancer, what will the first thing they'll do? They'll check to, they'll replicate that research. And most of the time they find it's wrong. 
Yep. So the problem we've got is not in industry or even in defence. Well, there may be some problems, but it's not a big problem. The problem is where that science is being used for policy, which is what you know Ainsley Kellow's book is, mm -hmm. is largely mm -hmm. about, or to, to mm -hmm. some extent about. And governments never, almost never check the science. They'll say, this is the science. We like it. We've got all our mates together and we go along. So what we've got to do is we've got, we've got, so we have group think for it, forming the, what's actually happening is the scientific institutions are dictating terms to the government. They're saying, you go along with this great Barrier Reef stuff or we'll, we will, um, publish a whole lot of stuff saying that you're deniers, you're not going mm -hmm. along with mm -hmm. the science. And mm -hmm. the, the politicians, apart from the odd one like Malcolm Roberts, who I know well, um, they're just like little poodles on the end of a string being told exactly what to do. So how do we how do we, we do that? And what I've been suggesting that um, we need the Minister of, say, Agriculture to say, OK, we've got all this um, stuff about cane farmers killing the Great Barrier Reef. I'm going to spend, I'm going to set aside a budget line for a million dollars and we're going to get some antagonistic scientists and do a proper peer review, not, not a quick read, which is what real, which is what genuine, which is the, you know, what actually happens in journals. But these guys are going to replicate the experiments and they're going to really do a good job on this and they're going yeah. to try to find what's wrong, yeah. which never, almost never happens in, in, the, in conventional peer review. Well, okay. So I guess one of the issues there is the issue around funding, because correct me if I'm wrong, peer review almost universally is unpaid, possibly universally, but certainly almost yeah. universally is unpaid. Yeah. And often, um, as I understand it, there have been instances in the past where it can be fairly clearly seen that someone has agreed to do peer review on someone else's article only because they're trying to ingratiate themselves to the editor of that particular publication so that they can get their next thing published as well. There are some real perverse incentives at play. Exactly. I mean, look, I've done hundreds of peer reviews and they're, they're frankly a pain in the neck, right? Because mm. you're not being paid. Mm. You do it as a, um, because you know you've got to, because, well, some, some poor bugger's going to have to peer review mine. I have a duty to do it. And so you do it. But mm. it's sort of on 10th on your list of things you want to do every day. And by the yeah. time, you know, the journal editor saying, you haven't done your review, let, you've had it for two months and you, oh, I better do it. I'll do it this evening. You quickly read this paper. Oh, it looks okay. And that's your peer review, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right. Some people will do a peer review because they want to get on the right side of the editor because the editors are always really grateful when they get a reviewer who actually says yes, okay, mm -hmm. because it's hard to find a peer reviewer. Um, but the, the fundamental problem with peer review is it's just such a cursory um, thing. I mean, a lot of, I mean, the scientific institutions go on about it being the gold standard. You know, if it's mm -hmm. been peer reviewed, this is wonderful. They think that maybe a dozen scientists have gone through this work and done the experiments again and then they're giving it a big tick. They don't know that it's just a quick read by a couple of people and one of those could even be your mate. Yeah. And that's the... So is it any wonder that 50% of it ends up being, um, you know, have major flaws in it? Yeah. I, I have a theory that is unprovable uh, but also unfalsifiable, so I'm just going to stick with it and say, hey, it, it must be true. Um that at any given moment in human history, for all of the past and all of the future, more than half of what we think we know will be wrong. Uh, yeah, I think that's largely true. By the way, it's not true in physics. I'm, I'm, I'm a physicist. If you if you open up a first year physics textbook, uh, I would bet you any money that all, almost all of that is going to be absolutely rock solid. Uh, in the average physics textbook, you will only ever find maybe one mistake in, you know, four or five hundred pages. So in that yeah. really rigorous science mm. where, you know, even with Newton's laws, you can say, well, Newton's laws aren't exact, that you've got to, you know, look at relativity. But the mm. thing is, we know Newton's laws are accurate within certain very well-known bounds, board. and we know the uncertainty in those bounds. Yeah. And that's all you can ever do, ever do. So it's wonderful. I, 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 I would agree. Things like engineering, etc. I mean, these are perfect examples of what you said, where they're actually creating something that can be tested. And, yeah. and therefore, we can find the flaws very quickly. I would say. And human... somebody dies and somebody dies yeah. if you make a mistake. The problem yeah. with the environmental science is that they can be wrong again and again and again. Oh, well, the reef didn't die last year. It's still going to die next year, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they can keep on going and it doesn't affect almost anybody except some poor farmer who's just trying uh, to make a living or a tourist yeah, yeah. operator.
um, or some depressed child who thinks the world has has virtually ended. Yeah. Well, it's uh, my reflection on, on you know, at any given moment in human history, more than half of what we think we know will be wrong, is more around the idea that the envelope of our knowledge is increasing. And the closer you get to the edge of that envelope, the greater the uncertainty, the, the, the more of a grain of salt you have to take with anything that we think we know. Um, and so it's, you know, the latest and greatest research has the highest chance of being wrong. Things like physics that we've been testing and retesting and establishing repeatedly would be somewhere very close to the center of that circle of, of knowledge. But as you approach that boundary, um, your, your probability of being correct is going to drop below 50%. And just simply by the nature of we're trying to understand things that we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of. I mean, look at human biology and, and medicine. There is so much that we don't know. There is so many, if we're actually honest and humble with ourselves, there's so much that we don't understand. And there are so many things that we try that we think should work and then don't, which tells us there's things that we don't understand. Um, and then, you, you know, yeah. I like your circle of knowledge. You know, there's these mm. things which we really know. Well, I often use the analogy, we need a Michelin star system. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> five, there's five star science, like Newton's laws of motions. You, sure. you can state your life on them. You do state yep. your life on you them, right? Every day, yep. yep. And, and then there's sort of like one star is a scientist who knows something about something, says something. Two stars would be, it's been peer-reviewed, all right? It's, mm. it's sort of, well, maybe it's right. And there's yeah. three stars where it's gone through a rigorous review and there's mm. four stars where it's gone, gone through many, many levels of replication. Mm. And then there's the five stars okay. where, you know, this is right. Yeah. It's just right. Yeah. 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 I mean, talk, talking medicine, do, do antibiotics work? Yes. How do we know? Yeah. Because we've been using them now for nine or a hundred years or a bit over a hundred years, I think now. Yeah. Um, and, and millions upon millions, if not billions of people have used them at some point in their life, we can replicate it over and over again in a Petri dish. I'm not sitting here going, we're probably wrong about, about penicillin. No. Right. No. Um, but are we right about um, mRNA delivery of, of, of vaccine into the body via that technology and how it interacts with the body, well, there's a much higher probability that we don't know what we're doing there because it's a new technology. That's yeah, all I'll precisely. say on that. Yeah, precisely. So, mm. so I don't get banned out of that. Uh... Now, someone has asked, um, does anyone know where the best place to get a copy of Science and Public Policy from? The Book Depository has it for over 200. Is this normal? I paid about 10 years ago, I paid nearly 100 or $120 for mine. So with inflation, honestly, it's probably about $200 now. Um, it's just one of those things where it's not a widely distributed book. And it's the kind of thing where if someone wants it, they really want it. You're not going to find it on the discount desk of your local um, you know, discount bookshop because they just it's just not going to be there. So um, to my knowledge, honestly, it, it sucks. But $200 is probably what you're, what you're up for on that. Sorry about that. Okay, so... Can we, how, how, how comfortable are you speaking a bit more specifically to the situation with fertilizer, farmers, et cetera? Because it seems very relevant right now with Sri Lanka, with Holland, uh, with, with Canada. We've been doing this to our farmers in Queensland for a little while now. Yeah. So the example I gave you before was pesticides. So you can't measure mm. them, right? They, they're so low. They're, they're unmeasurably low. Mm. With fertilizers, so we're talking about nitrates and phosphates largely, you know, nitrogen and phosph phosphorus fertilizer. When you actually, um, you know, so some of this washes down off the farms, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, in the nearshore zone, there is naturally huge amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus cycling across the seabed, about sure. 100 times more than comes down all the rivers. So even if you turned off all the farms, you'd only reduce the amount of phosphorus by 1%. You couldn't even measure that, by the way, because of the way yeah. it's, it's hard to actually... It, but that's in, inshore, um, and there's almost no reefs close inshore. If you go further offshore uh, to, to where the Great Barrier Reef is, the, the effect of the nitrogen and phosphorus is even less. Mm. Let's also remember that the Great Barrier Reef is a, is a very well flushed system. So if you, want, um, if you want to pollution to build up, Sydney Harbour is the ideal place, right, because yeah, okay. it's enclosed. If you put a drop of water in Sydney Harbour somewhere up above the bridge there, it takes mm. somewhere around two-thirds of a year before that drop of water will be flushed to the outer sea and escape. Yeah. So you can imagine yeah. if you chuck a whole lot of stuff into Sydney Harbour, it can build up and build up. Mm. In the Great Barrier Reef, the average drop of water, especially in the offshore re regions, will have left that, that area within about uh, probably two weeks. So yeah, right. there's as much water that flushes in and out of the Great Barrier Reef from the Pacific Ocean in eight hours as comes down all the rivers in a whole year. 
So mm. these rivers, they're just irrelevant. As far as the Great Barrier Reef is concerned, it barely even knows about the land, okay? The, the land is 50 kilometres away in large, largely. It knows mm. about the Pacific Ocean flooding in. And by the way, the Pacific Ocean also brings in huge quantities of nutrients in very, very low concentrations, but nevertheless, they're mm. coming in. So, uh, yeah, fertiliser is just not a, not a thing for the, for the reef. But, of course, if you reduce fertiliser, you will slowly reduce the productivity. Now, they're going to get away with it for the moment, but they're slowly being dragged down and even reducing productivity by 5 or 10% mm. uh, in the sugar industry, that can tip you over the limit. And we, yeah. we're starting to see reductions in yields in some of the farms already. Yeah. And this is, this is the thing that annoys me, is when people say, oh, but it's only a small reduction. You know, it's only, it's only a, look, you know, food prices might go up 10% because we've reduced productivity. That is such a, if I can use a buzzword, that is such a privileged perspective yeah. on this issue to sit there and go, oh, well, I can afford to pay a little bit more for my food. Well, that's yeah. nice for you, but there's a lot of people that can't and for whom this actually becomes a life and death issue. Exactly. Um, and of course, what, what it is, is um, if you're a farmer up here, it just looks like there's a whole bunch of city slickers who have no idea about what goes on outside their city boundary. They've almost never been outside. And right. yes, you're right. They can drink their wine and they can do all their things and they're, they're very comfortable. Mm. Um, but it's not like that. If you reduce the productivity of a cane farm by 10%, that can be the difference between whether you're making a profit or a loss and you go Correct. out of business. Right. And that's a serious deal for these people. And all for what? So that we can reduce the... Um, that 1% uh, uh, increment in, in, in nitrogen in the near shore zone where there are hardly any corals anyway mm. by some tiny fraction. You know, mm. it, it's, mm. it's just a crazy thing to do for no reason. Well, this, this parallels once again with the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, I, I identified uh, in late 2020 that there was going to be a very serious impact to global food prices as a result of all of the logistics um, impacts of, of the lockdowns and etc. And um, so I did a video talking about the fact that there was an enormous amount of water. Now, at the time, we hadn't had the rainfall that we've had since. So it's a bit of a moot point now. Um, the farmers, in many cases, can't use more water than what they've already got. But at the time, there was a lot of water being held in environmental reserves and farmers had spare capacity, essentially, on their land to be able to, to, to plant. It was the right time of year that if a decision was made quickly, then farmers would have been able to actually take steps over the following two months to get crops in the ground, irrigate them, etc., and help to at least reduce the severity of, of that, that food crisis. And again, I, this, I, I don't think we can stress this enough. We sit there and go, oh, wow, cauliflower is expensive. Lettuce is expensive. Oh, $10 for a head of lettuce. Oh, oh, oh wow, the world's gone mad. Um, there are people who have only been pulled out of extreme poverty in the last 10, 15, 20 years, particularly in Africa, but also large parts of Asia, some parts of South America, et cetera where entire countries, entire cultures have only just come out of abject poverty, borderline subsistence malnutrition, and now they're being pushed back into it because that 10, 20, 30% increase in food costs is literally, it's, it's literally life and death for these people. Exactly. So, I mean, you've seen the craziness in Sri Lanka, but the, yeah. the mere fact that fertilizer prices have gone through the roof, now we can, mm -hmm. we can deal with that to some extent in, in Australia, but if you're in India or somewhere like that, uh, where this is actually a major cost and now the price of that fertiliser has gone through the roof, it's inevitably going to, to, to create, um, well, it's going to almost certainly there's going to be, you know, it, it won't necessarily be starvation in the sense of the old famines of the 1960s, but it will be this mm. sort of chronic undernutrition where babies will die where they wouldn't have died before. This is what's going to happen. And I'm, I'm sick and tired of people being self-righteous about saving animals at the expense of humans. I, I, and I just that, that sanctimonious self-righteous, no, we have to save the reef. Okay, but in the process, you understand you're killing people. And, and they either don't get it or, or I think in some cases they do get it and they genuinely actually don't care. Well, they might not. I mean, I would say... My answer to that actually would be, no, we're not killing the reef. So, you know, it, really the, the question no, doesn't no. even arise. Uh, yeah. Now, there would be instances where there may be a, a toss-up between the two and, 
Uh, and normally the answer to that would be there should be ways to save the people and save the environment if you're prepared to to, to follow genuine science. Mm. But our problem is we're not, we're not. We don't do genuine science in the environment, mental stuff to a large extent. No, sadly, sadly, I, I, I don't disagree. So how do we fix that, though? Um, this is this appears to be widespread. This appears to be across multiple areas of science, multiple, mostly environmental related, but right across the environmental sciences, right across many different countries, the UK, the US, Australia, etc., right across many different scientific institutions and funded and fed by politicians that see advantage in, in being seen to give money to, to research and this and that and uh, end up making the problem worse because if you want to get money, you have to research the right things and come to the right conclusions. How do you fix science when it's broke or environmental science when it's broken to that degree? Well, firstly, people have to, uh, and politicians have to accept that um, there really is a problem here. Um, this latest coral cover statistics, in my view, is a wonderful vehicle for a, mm. a, a politician to say, hang on here, what's going on? Um, maybe we need to do some quality checks. So I keep on using the words quality assurance, quality assurance. Sure because that is the fundamental problem. There's no quality assurance. Why don't we just check that there hasn't been a bit of an exaggeration? This is what a politician should be saying. Uh, I reckon if, if they did that, um, yes, the Guardian would say, oh, they're a denier. They're not following the science. Yeah, but most there's... people look at that and say, well, hang on, we've got, we've got record coral cover. Maybe, maybe we should do a little bit of checking. I mean, what's, what's the... What could go wrong if we do a little bit more checking? What could possibly be the problem with that? So the, this latest statistics to me is a really important milestone and we, we've been you know, almost blessed that it's happened at a very good time mm. and politicians are going to need to stand up. Now, I've been suggesting a thing called an Office of uh, Policy Science Quality Assurance where the government would set up a, a thing to do the quality assurance on the science they're using for uh, policy. The problem, though, is that it would almost certainly be captured, like yes. every other institution. Yes, like every, and so, especially any government-funded institution. Precisely. So I think now it has to be done. I, I've got a huge... Uh, my view of politicians now is much higher than it was a few years ago. I realise now that the politicians' biggest problem is actually they are... They've been told what to do by the bureaucracy of which the scientific institutions are part. And that's mm -hmm. their huge battle. And they, they're, they're, they're being blackmailed to do what they're, they're told. And I know of lots of um, politicians on actually both sides of politics mm. who know that there's problems here, but, that, that, but actually it's hard to do something about. Well, but let's imagine that there was a, a Minister of Agriculture who was getting an inkling of idea that maybe some of this fertiliser stuff wasn't right. They should just in the next budget... So I want a budget line in the Department of Agriculture where we're going to do uh, quality assurance audits. I, as the minister, I'm going to select that site. I'm not going to leave it to my mm. Sir Humphrey Applebee's mm -hmm. and the other yeah. people to do it because yeah. in the end we can do something about politicians, but you can't do much about these bureaucrats, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's where the problem. We've got to hand the power back to the people, and you do that ironically by getting it back to um, the, the politicians. By the way, another thing that needs to happen with politicians is they need to be given much more staff in order to really check these politicians. Okay. We should multiply it by 10. Somebody might, like Malcolm Roberts can do a much better job if he's given the staff to, you know, really, really Dive investigate in what is going on. Mm -hmm. And, of course, one of the things that, that happens very regularly is you, you find... Uh, especially on the Labor side, they will take the staff away from the opposition uh, senators. Uh, yeah. And that's a huge thing because that's the only accountability that there is. It's only the politicians that are holding these people yeah. to account. Public well, service, way. Right? We've just seen that. And, and I'm, I'm hearing you know, mixed reviews. Different people have different opinions on, on whether this most recent uh, reduction in the number of staff that, that senators get uh, is is fair or not. But I, I tend to find myself coming down on, on a similar side to yourself. I mean, I was... I was giving some thought to how I would structure my own office in the very unlikely event that I happened to win in, in uh, the Senate in Tasmania at the last federal election, which, of course, I didn't. Um, but I, I was giving some advanced thought to that and thinking about who I would I would want and, and the competencies that I would need and how I would have to structure that. And you do very quickly realise 
that between you know making sure that your constituents feel heard and that they're hearing back from you and looking into the things that they bring up actually having to keep up with the legislation that's being put forward because um you know the, the major parties obviously they can just do what they're told uh the minor parties someone's got to read it um you know and actually and actually wrap their head around it um they, you've got very little time left at that point to really do anything particularly useful the politicians are, are run off their feet by the day-to-day mm. thing mm. and they're trying to get around their heads around far too many many things this you know it's a it's a horrific job for them and that's mm. why they I, I literally mean you multiply their staff by a factor of 10 yeah wow and then they can really start to, to put some heat on people because they can say all right I've got this guy who I've hired I'm going to get them to really drill into what's going on on fertilizer on the Great Barrier or lots and lots of other things which are going on in this country which we never know about because it's all hidden right a lot mm. of things are, are hidden mm. uh, so I think that's a hugely important thing but it's very difficult to do well, here it is from the horse's mouth. Malcolm, apologies for calling you a horse. Um, the reduction in staff affects my ability to investigate, interrogate, and advocate. One man simply can't do it all. Now, I've spent a few days yep. at Malcolm's side traveling around the Murray-Darling Basin. His work ethic exceeds mine by a significant margin. Yep. His yep. level of energy, his level of focus, and his willingness to just do the work is phenomenal. And if he can't keep up, I certainly wouldn't be able to, and uh, no one else that I can think of would be able to. No, precisely. It's just Im impossible. You, you're right. He he yeah. works 24-7 effectively. It's, it's, uh, and it's, and it's, there's, there's actually quite a few of them. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of lazy ones too, but quite a few of them do. Mm. Um, and they just need support. And uh, I'm, I'm a huge believer in that. If there's one thing you could do, that would make a big difference. Mm, interesting. I, I hadn't come at it from that angle, but that is that is an interesting thought. So let's, let's talk. Someone asked before, you know, what was the actual... Um, cause of you being dismissed from the university there were the court cases that happened I think there's a lot of people I think have taken the wrong lessons out of the court cases blah 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 could you just kind of tell that story at whatever level of detail you want to from when you first stepped out of line I guess is probably when the story really starts when you first began to say hey actually this the science that we're reporting over here isn't rigorous um, all the way through till uh, the court cases and and everything else all right. Well, I start at the very beginning. So I, I worked as a physical oceanographer and also as an, a developing instrumentation uh, okay. in the 80s and 90s. We were working on mud around coral reefs and whether, you know, dredges and stuff coming down from farms was killing reefs. And yeah. myself and some co-workers, we invented the instrumentation so we could monitor uh, suspended sediment around corals for long periods of time. And, okay. you know, with the geologists, we demonstrated without any shadow of a doubt that that, um, that there was, the stuff coming from farms was insignificant, the stuff coming from dredges was insignificant. But strangely, this message wasn't getting out, that farmers were still mm. being blamed, even though we mm. demonstrated this. And I couldn't quite work out why this was happening. And, and then I started to look at other areas of, uh, science of the Great Barrier Reef where, you know, some of this stuff with fertilisers and, and then climate change. And then I realised that a lot of that science was also wrong and it was demonstrably mm -hmm. just complete and utter rubbish. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember looking at one paper which was saying that the Great Barrier Reef was 30% of the way to ecological extinction. And the way they'd done it was just staggering. You know, there were all these statistical errors. But one of the craziest things was they said effectively that the Aboriginal people were responsible for 25% of the decline of the Great Barrier Reef when they arrived um, on the land bridge. Now, the thing was, the Great Barrier Reef didn't even exist in those days. So, so how could they have? <laughs> so there were things like that. And that none of this was ever, ever retracted. And, and I kept on wondering, what is going on here? You know, is it just the Great Barrier Reef science that's a load of baloney or is it more widespread? And then what happened in 2013, my brother actually sent me a, a copy of a, uh, an article in The Economist magazine talking about the replication crisis and how it was right through the biomedical sciences mm -hmm. and it was well accepted that 50% of biomedical literature was complete rubbish and it mm -hmm. suddenly dawned on me there is a quality assurance problem. I've, mm -hmm. I've had a background in quality assurance doing you know uh, commercial work for the university and you could see, well, this is the problem and I decided, all right, from now on, I'm going to work on this quality assurance problem I was starting to get older. My kids had left school. I'd seen Bob Carter, the, the famous um, climate sceptic, who was one of my um, very close associates. 
mm. pushed out of the university, James Cook University. Mm. So I knew it was likely that what was going to happen was going to happen. I just mm -hmm. didn't know when. Uh, I There was a, a famous, well, an infamous example where there was a, a coral reef around an island near Bowen in North, in North Queensland which the institutions were saying had no coral whatsoever. And they kept on showing these pictures of the, of the coral in 1890 uh, at a very low tide. It had beautiful coral. And then today, and there was no coral. And, and they were saying, this is caused by farmers. And I was saying, this can't be right. So I sent a couple of my guys down, go down to Stone Island Reef, see if there's any coral. Of course, they come back, beautiful pictures of beautiful coral. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this to a journalist and said, there's a quality assurance problem here. These guys are misleading the public. And I got hammered with a censure from the university and told I'm not allowed to do that again. So I sort of, I went away and sulked for about a year. And then I wrote a paper, an article in uh, Climate Change, the Facts with the IPA, looking at the effect of um, coral bleaching and uh, climate change on the reef and pointing out that really it's not a big deal for the reef at all. If anything, you'd expect the, the coral to grow faster in warmer water. The effect mm -hmm. of bleaching has been negligible as this latest data has completely conclusively proven. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I did an interview on Alan Jones's program where I uh, said that due to systemic deficiencies in the quality assurance processes, i.e. peer review is rubbish and mm. that's what we use, that a lot of the work coming out from the science institution is untrustworthy. And I added up that there was the extra problem that in the environmental sciences, there is the problem of a lot of the scientists are actually emotional about the reef. And you can understand why, because it's such a beautiful thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. They, and they, are, so, they are so convinced of the righteousness of their cause that fudging and or being less rigorous than they ought to be is justified. Precisely. Anyway, me saying that they were untrustworthy, which was a pretty hard thing to say. In fact, there's nothing more disrespectful you can say to a scientist than yeah. you, your QA is so rubbish that yeah. I can't trust your results. But it's yeah. true, right? And I believe it to be true. Anyway, the university didn't like that very much. And uh, they hit me with a, another a charge, which this was going to clearly going to lead to dismissal because it was serious misconduct. I've already been done... <laughs> I've been, you know, I've been one strike and this one's going to be. Uh, so we got some legal um, help. Then what happened was the university decided to search all my emails. So they went through all my emails to try to find dirt. And I tell you what, that was pretty frightening. I got mm. this 128 page uh, list of another 25 serious misconduct allegations. And I sweated. But I read through them all and I thought, whew. That's okay. They didn't actually find anything that I was ashamed of. In fact, one of the funny things was they said, because I'd written, one of my students had got very concerned and said, what's the university doing to me? And I, I wrote back and I said, look, JC is no worse than any other university. In fact, it's better than most. I actually said it's mm. probably better than UQ because I would have been fired from them ages ago. <laughs> and, and, I, and I then went on and said, um, the all universities are Orwellian. I use the term Orwellian because they pretend to value free speech, but actually crush it. Mm. And that was a that was another misconduct charge. So the university then read my emails, which is a personal email to a student, and they get me for saying that the university is Orwellian. So <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Uh, anyway, it went sort of from bad to worse. Um, we filed in court. The university, I think, were we, there was a lot of publicity, and I think the university were hoping that, um, we'll just give him a censure. We won't. Yep. We, so I'm, we won't I'm, just answering, I'm just answering the question that I was asked. Uh, where is it? It's it's there. Sorry. I'm 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 chatting with the viewers whilst also uh, chatting no, with you. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm hoping to get a cup of tea fairly soon in about five minutes. <laughs> no, it is time. It's just about to go yeah, nine o'clock. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, anyway, so they, they censured me, but they said, but you're not allowed to say any of this quality assurance stuff ever again. And I said, well, I can't because that's that's what I'm about. I'm not going to, I either take my, I keep my job, but I can't do my job as an academic or I fight this. And one of the problems was that there's this strange confidentiality clause in my work uh, contract. Uh, and in order to fight the legal uh, challenge, which ultimately cost $1.5 million, we, we raised $1.5 million 
from 10,000 donations, and it also cost us personally 300,000, in order to raise that amount of money for legals, you need to put up on web pages exactly what I'm charged for. I'm an academic. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. need to know this is not about sexual misconduct. This is yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I had to put up all those 28 pages of, of supposed serious misconduct, and people laughed at it. But of course, the university says, well, now you've broken the confidentiality thing. But we had no choice. It was, we, we just had to do that. Anyway, we won in the lower court. The um, Justice Vaster said, no, academic freedom, they're not allowed to, to, to tell you to, um, uh, what to say. And they also said the confidentiality uh, um, doesn't apply because the academic freedom clauses, so I have academic freedom, actually mm -hmm. specifically says I have a right to question decisions and processes within the university. Yeah. So in the lower court, we got we won. We then went to the um, the federal court, uh, three judges. So the, university, the university appealed that decision from the lower yeah. court or this was a separate thing? No, the university appealed. They obviously didn't like that. Um, we were awarded um, a million dollars, which we never got, of course, because we ultimately <laughs> lost. So no. we then uh, appealed, well, they appealed to the uh, federal court, three judges. Two of them said, no, essentially the... You've got, to, you've got to be polite. You're not allowed to be disrespectful. Um, this academic freedom thing effectively isn't really a thing. Uh, and by the way, they have a right to tell you to be silent uh, in this confidentiality. The third judge said, no, 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 no. That confidentiality thing is a very Kafkaesque. They actually use the mm -hmm. term Kafkaesque. Mm -hmm. They should not be able to tell you to keep silent the charges that they make against you. Yes, I shouldn't be allowed to say things that other people have said about me, but I should be able to say, I'm being hit with a charge here and this is what the charge is. Mm -hmm. So we then we then appealed to the High Court and we only, to be fair, we only just got the leave to appeal and the High Court came down 5 nil against us um, in terms of no payout. But, and this is the interesting thing, they said the university acted unlawfully mm. in censoring me, that I had academic freedom, they never should have told me um, not to talk about quality assurance. Um, so in that sense, we won. But they said that the confidentiality clauses meant that they were able to tell me to be silent about the university's unlawful uh, behaviour. They went further and said that the um, academic freedom is only protected if it's in one's field of expertise. So that example about Orwellian that I gave you, they said the university was allowed to tell me that that was um, not in, that they could fire me for that because I'm a physicist, I'm a physical oceanography, I don't know anything about Orwellian or, or those sorts of things. It's not covered by academic freedom, so they can fire me for that. So that was a little bit sad uh, and, and a lot crazy. It was really crazy, but yeah. we did win the main point that academic freedom has been uh, upheld in a high court decision, um, partly due, in fact, largely due to One Nation, uh, Pauline Hanson and Malcolm Roberts. There is now new legislation in Parliament um, which supports academic freedom. And if that legislation, which went through last year, uh, yes, last year, if that had been in action when I got into trouble, I think I would have I would have got away with it without any difficulty. Mm. So we yeah. are ahead. And, in fact, there is one case where uh, I think the university has pulled their, their charges against an academic largely because of what happened with the high court. Mm. Uh, so it's not all bad news by a long sea mile for us. Yep, it cost a lot and I lost mm -hmm. my job and all the rest of it. I wouldn't, I'd certainly do it again. I, I wouldn't hesitate to do it again. But, you know, there's the law and there's justice, and they're not always the same thing. <laughs> that is the slogan that I live by. <laughs> I was wondering um, what it, I was trying to read what it was down the bottom yeah, there. It never got down to the break, last line. Mm. Good people break bad laws. That is, that's going to be the title of the book that I'm working on. It is a slogan that I live by. It's essentially the modernization and summary of an idea that's been around for thousands of years. Um, you know, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who who said uh, one has not only a moral obligation to obey just laws, but a moral obligation to disobey unjust laws. Yeah. Um, and there are times when people like you and I, um, Peter, we see things that we just can't walk past. 
Exactly. I mean, I, I got to the stage, it just pissed me off, right? It mm. just did. And and also, as I said before, I was getting, you know, I'm over 60 now. When I got into travel, I was in my very late 50s. You think, well, the young people can't do what I did because they've got a mortgage, they've got kids at school, mm -hmm. you know, it's the end of their job, right? Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. my case, I'm at the end of my career, was firing. Yeah, it was, it was emotionally... <laughs> wasn't very nice, but in terms yeah. of my finances, yes, it certainly affected them and it, 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 mm. it annoys me considerably that we've lost all that money. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I was I had a pretty damn good wage as a professor at a university. It's not like I'm I'm struggling. Uh, and you do have, you, you have an obligation. But in the end, it, it just annoys you so much you can't keep your mouth shut, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't be able to be made to keep your mouth shut. Um, you know, one of the one of the um, people that I featured in a video that I did many years ago, I did a video called The Forbidden History of Unpopular People. And uh, I featured Ignaz Semmelweis, who was the um, physician who hundreds of years ago, um, first began to notice a correlation between doctors cutting up cadavers and teaching students at their at their hospitals at the time, uh, and then going in to deliver a baby, and then the mother's dying of sepsis afterwards. And he was the first one who began to go, now, hang on. Yep. Mothers are dying more frequently in my hospital than they are when they give birth in the gutter outside. We must be doing something wrong. And he began to question yep. what they were doing. And he, through trial and error and just trying desperately to figure it out, he came to the conclusion that uh, it was something to do with cutting up dead bodies and then going and delivering babies. And so he then instituted a set of rules whereby doctors had to wash their hands in this very caustic concoction of lime and, and other things. It was quite, by all accounts, it was quite unpleasant. And they had to wash for a certain number of minutes and blah, 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 much like a modern hand washing regime, although we use more sophisticated things now. Uh, and immediately the number of women dying of postpartum infections dropped, not to zero, but to not that far from it. Uh, a dramatic, dramatic reduction. So he then went out and he published the results and he urged all European hospitals to copy his method. And he got ridiculed and he got excommunicated from various polite medical societies. And uh, ultimately, he died, ironically, of an infection in an insane asylum. Because yeah. as he was ignored more and more, and as he saw more and more the results of his own work, he did manage to roll it out in a couple more hospitals. And the same thing happened. The data just became astronomically better. And the whole world was ignoring him. And he... he, he became quite an unpleasant person. And I'm going to be talking about him a lot in my chapter uh, in, in Defense of Assholes in my book, Good People Break Bad yeah. Laws. Like, just because someone isn't collegiate yes. doesn't give us the right to dismiss them. He's let, the letters that he was writing not long before they locked him up in an insane asylum were very forthright, let me, let me tell you. Yeah. They were very, they were, he was literally telling these hospital administrators, you are murdering these women. You have yeah. the data. I've been on you for years. They are dying and it's your fault. Like he's literally just laying it all down. And so they went and they got him and they threw him in, in, in an insane asylum. And yeah. I think it was the eighth day in the insane, insane asylum, a, um, a guard beat him to a pulp and he ended up dying from an infection uh, as a result of his injuries. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm familiar with the story. I didn't, know that, I didn't know that horrible ending, but I am familiar um, with that mm. one. And you're right that um, you do need people like that to stand up. And in his case, he was saving lives. And you can understand why he would have got incredibly annoyed at what's going on. And yeah. the point that I used, I, I made to, um, you know, to the university in the early days is to say, all right, I've demonstrated again and again and again that there's a whole lot of problems at the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the JCU mm. Coral Reef Centre. Mm. There's a quality assurance problem. How do I say that in a way they're not going to get upset? I mean... What possible way, what words can I use to say your QA is shite? Right? <laughs> that, there's just no way of doing it. They're yeah. going to get upset. And what they should do is they should come back and say, Peter, no, you're wrong. I'm upset with you. And this is the reason why you're wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. But they never did that, of course. I, I, well, I loved what you said a minute ago, that the worst thing you can do to a, to a true scientist anyway is to actually say that their their methodology, their conclusions, their their integrity is questionable um to say to a true scientist you're wrong they'll go i don't think i am but what have you got yeah right that's that's what a true scientist would would say yeah. you know no I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm right but but let's talk show me what you got 
Um, but but to if if their entire worldview is founded on on you know shifting sand, so to speak, um, yeah, I mean, how do you say that nicely? That's that's it's an impossibility, isn't it? Uh, it's it's totally impossible, and um, and this is where you've got. I've got my cup of tea now, so I'm I'm happy yeah, yeah. with my cup You're of good. tea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's totally impossible. But there there is a duty, and and this was accepted by the High Court. They said mm. that there is no duty of collegiality. They may not have yeah. used those exact words, but um, and so that was a good thing that's come out. And to be fair, if you're looking around the world. I mean, universities are a basket case and there have mm. been some horrible problems with academics running foul. But especially in the UK, it has just turned. Uh, there's okay. a thing called the Free Speech Union, which works a lot in universities. And there's a lot of universities which are now being sort of hauled over the coals for some of the crazy things they're doing. Well, I hope that that extends very soon to the UK public because we're seeing some really insane arrests going on for people. <laughs> Um, retweeting tweets and all sorts of like, oh, goodness. Um, so that's, that, that's an interesting area to, to head into next. To what degree do you think that the, the, these issues that we're seeing in science are actually just reflective of the wider cultural shift? It, it's, it's no longer acceptable culturally to disagree with the prevailing zeitgeist. Uh, are we seeing some parallels there, do you think? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I, I think... That's probably always been something of a problem uh, that there's been, a, you know, it used to be probably a more conservative thing. You weren't allowed to, you know, say nasty things about the church. I mean, I think sure. um, John Cleese said there's no way he could have made Life of Brian yeah. um, 20 years before, and he certainly couldn't have made it now. Uh, so there, no. there has always been this problem. But I think the difference now is that that the, the zeitgeist has gone to the crazy left. So, mm. that you know, there's, I mean, things that, that just 10 years ago you would say, no, this is completely barking mad have happened. Yeah. Yeah. But even to the point where now, you, as you said, we've got, you know, um, English coppers going around essentially arresting people for retweeting something which is pretty yeah. damned innocuous. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy yeah. what's happened. Look, I mean, I'm up on criminal charges for the crime of urging people to exercise their human rights during lockdowns. Um, now, I don't actually know where you stand on all that stuff, and, and it's it's by the by. But yeah. once upon a time, the right to protest your government and to gather with other like-minded people to chant slogans and so forth was yeah. sacrosanct, was absolutely sacrosanct. You could not violate that right. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we just had this, this fear campaign that came along, um, and now it's optional. The government can tell you when and where and how you're allowed to protest or, or not. Yeah. This, this is fast becoming an intractable problem in the sense that the mechanisms by which we would walk this back are the very mechanisms being taken off us. Precisely. And, you know, I'm with you on this. I, I, I find the whole thing incredibly scary, what's happened, mm. the way that people have accepted this, this sort of drift into rule by, you know, this technocracy, uh, bureaucracy uh, yeah. who decide what's good for us and that you're not allowed to, to protest. You're not allowed to say, you know, things which just a few years ago, like a man is a man and a woman is a woman. You know, <laughs> oh, you that, that would get you banned from Twitter. <laughs> I, I often I... say, you know, I often make point that I obviously, you know, when I was at university, you'd sit around in your third years and you'd talk bullshit and, and you think, uh, what, what, what's going to happen in 40 years' time? You know, we wouldn't have known if somebody said, oh, there's going to be these mobile phone things and everybody's going to be able to talk to each other. And we say, ah, oh, mm. yeah, well, maybe that's possible, but I can't see mm. it, you know. No, no. If somebody said, oh, what's going to happen here is that, you know, we're just going to suddenly have it that a, that a man can change into a woman and, and that all these other crazy things that happen, we would have said, oh, come on, don't be silly. Oh. Uh, so this is what's happened to us. Well, that, that scene from Life of Brian, and, and there's two reasons why I love the scene, is, is obviously, you know, the, the you can't be a woman, which is so yeah. politically incorrect now. Yeah. Um, but also, um, no, we're the Judean people's front. So where's the people's front of Judea? He's over there. Um, yeah. You know, it's it was, I, I watched all of that play out during the protest movement down here in Victoria. It was, it was so frustrating watching people finding division amongst themselves. Yeah. Um, can can I tell you another story uh, about, sure. you know, this uh, man-woman thing? I like to tell this one as well because it's my father who I had a great admiration yeah. for. He was a yeah. school teacher and he was always a bit of a wag. And one of the things he used to say when he came into the classroom was, ladies, gentlemen, and others. 
And of course, everybody would laugh because it was mm -hmm. a stupid thing to say. But mm -hmm. what he didn't realize, he was 40 years ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to teach salsa dancing. Uh, believe it or not, you wouldn't know it looking at me now, but I used to. I used to be pretty. Um, I used to teach salsa dancing in uh, in a, a school in the city in Melbourne, and I just taught the beginners, like the real basic levels. I'm not an advanced dancer, but I'm, I've got a loud voice. I'm a good communicator, and I could <clears> teach <throat> beginners. And so at the start of the very first week, I would say, "Look, um, you know, can I get the the ladies on this side of the room? Can I get the blokes on this side of the room? And if you're not sure, join me in the middle." Yes. Right. Yes, that's right. And at one point, we then had some people who, you know, had the whole coloured hair, asymmetrical haircut, whole sort of thing going on, who took exception to that. And in my very first ever episode of self-censorship, I realised I needed to stop telling that joke because sooner or later, someone was going to yeah. drag me into court yeah. uh, just for, for that. You know, it just utterly astonishing. And, and what you said before, like... Let's not forget, less than 20 years ago, the entirety of all sides of politics, with maybe one or two exceptions, were opposed to the idea that marriage would be redefined to include same-sex couples, yep. right? Now, you'd, you'd, there's very few that would change it back. But we have people going through everyone's history. Oh, that comedian said this thing 20 years ago, right? Well, hang on, turnabout is fair play. Why aren't we going back through all the Labor politicians' history and saying, well, he once said that marriage should be between a man and a woman, so therefore, you know, let's let's get him out of out of Parliament. He's not acceptable anymore. It seems to be very selective, this outrage. Anyway, I'm not here to be a cultural warrior. Um, we're, we're here to talk science and and uh, some of the bigger sort of scientific battles that are that are going on. What happens to us if we continue down this path. I mean, we're getting a glimpse in Sri Lanka. We're getting a glimpse of what can happen when people push back in, in Holland. Uh, I'm watching Canada with interest. I mean, we know the truckies uh, will certainly mobilise in large numbers over the whole COVID thing in, in Canada. Will, will farmers and perhaps a coalition of farmers and truckies mobilise as Trudeau moves ahead with this 30% reduction that he's trying to do? What, what does the world look like if we don't start to learn from some of these mistakes soon? Well, it's a disaster. Um, you know, there, there will be starvation if more and more people do this 30% reduction in, in fertilisers. I mean, I mean, Canada is a big uh, uh, grain uh, exporter. So, no, it's a disaster. But I, I do think things are, are changing. I think the, mm. the Europeans are staring down the barrel at the moment. They, you know, I, I mentioned that the politicians are like poodles at the, the feet mm -hmm. of... Um, the bureaucrats, but the Germans are certainly a poodle at the feet of Vladimir Putin at the moment. Yeah. They are doing exactly what he says. They'll, Vladimir allows them to make a few comments about Ukraine and send a couple <laughs> of tanks, but not too many. Yeah. But they know very well, we can just turn this off and you're finished. Yeah. So they, yeah. they're, they're facing a bit of reality. Unfortunately, I think there's going to be a few poor old grandmas are going to freeze in England and Northern Europe this winter. Um, there's going to be a lot of very upset people and eventually the politicians are going to face the reality. So, you know, maybe this is the crunch. Now, up to now, you look at, well, these crises happen and they seem to always get the wrong lesson. You know, they mm. learn the wrong lesson. That They're saying, yeah. oh, we've run out of energies we need more windmills the problem is we don't have enough gas so we've got to have more mm -hmm. windmills mm -hmm. rather than well you know you close down all your reliable you power. power you've now yeah. got unreliable power and now you're yeah. forced to use gas okay so a question without notice and someone did ask this earlier in the comments and i put it on the screen briefly so thank you for that comment uh, that question because it put it in my mind without notice feel free to dodge dismiss what have you all options are on the table for you What's your position on nuclear power in Australia? Good, bad, indifferent, how would you go about it if you would go about it? I would definitely go about it. Um, in fact, I, I, I remember probably close to 20 years ago, myself and a, a, a PhD student, we made a, a case that we should have nuclear power in Townsville, that we needed yep. a nuclear power station, um, that you know all the, the major problems with nuclear power are minor, and Fukushima actually proved that. We had four nuclear, well, three blew their top, right? We did this Listen to the man. Not once, not Listen twice. to the man. Yep. And, you know, there's, we made the point that in the centre of Townsville, there's a big hill called Castle Hill. There is far more uranium in Castle Hill than in any nuclear reactor, that 
Right at the moment, I'm absorbing a whole lot of radiation coming out through the ground. I'm absorbing it coming from cosmic rays up above. We live in a radiation environment. Why are we scared of it? Okay, you know, nuclear power has a very small amount. Um, that I think that they're, you know, this move to small modular nuclear power stations makes a whole lot of sense because you can build mm -hmm. a lot of production line. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced you can do it as cheaply as you can burn coal. Um, but, you know, coal does have other problems, not just the, you know, I, I don't think it's a, a particular problem for the climate and there's huge advantages in producing more carbon dioxide so all your plants produce, uh, grow faster. But, yeah. um, you know, the, the move to nuclear power to me makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's hysteria about it. Here we are exporting this stuff to around the world, but we won't build one ourselves. It's crazy. And, it's crazy. and we, won't, we won't accept back the waste. We exported the raw product. They yeah. then refined it, purified it, used it as fuel. And then we're like, oh, no, you can't send it back here to where it came from in the first place. And yet we have the perfect place to put nuclear waste. And remember, the amount of nuclear waste is tiny. At the moment, where's all this nuclear waste being stored? Nobody knows. Or I'll tell you. It's actually on the site of the nuclear power station. Yeah, it's, it's they build a bit of a the shed. Site. They build yep. a shed out the back. It's not yep. just a shed. It's a really good which, shed. Which honestly... It's the best place for it, surely. That whole site is being monitored. If anything goes wrong, we're going to well, know about it straight away. I can tell you a better place for it. Okay. You dug it out of a uranium mine. You put it back in the uranium mine and you cover it over. Okay? You, you make it's it an point. easy I, thing to do. I that, that, after all, it was it was radioactive down there, and there was a lot more radioactive because a lot of the the the, the stuff you dig out you can't use because it's too low grade. Yep. Huge amount of radiation in that great you know cubic kilometer that you've mined. Yep. Just put it back. Or there's plenty of places in the Northern Territory, Queensland, uh, Western Australia, where you could bury it in big mine shaft. It's not a problem. More mm -hmm. of a problem is the nuclear proliferation that, that mm -hmm. somebody could break in and um, you could have making dirty bombs. But the problem with a dirty bomb is not that it will kill, you know, so this is where you, you just get radiate, uh, radioactive material, you wrap yep. it up with explosives, make a big bang and you spread radiation. Yep. And yeah. the problem there is not the radiation itself, it's the fear of radiation. Mm. So I'll give you a statistics for Chernobyl, right? Mm. The number of people it actually killed was, I forget the exact numbers, 20, it might have been 100, at the absolute screaming outside. But the real loss was that, I forget the exact numbers, but, but there was something like 10,000, it may have even been 100,000 unnecessary pregnancy terminations in Eastern Europe because mm. women were scared that the radiation mm. crowd might have affected their baby. Mm. Now, that was unnecessary, completely unnecessary because the levels were trivial. So what we did, just like COVID, just like some of the others, is we scared the living daylights out of the population yeah. about a, yeah. a, a, a very, very minor threat, and we did far more damage than the radiation uh, due to the fear so the yes, same thing, I'm a big fan. The, the same thing happened with Fukushima. Number of people yep. killed. Uh, the explosion itself uh, obviously was was devastating. Yep, uh, killed one person. Number of people killed by radiation, zero. Um, and you remember, like, let's just cast our mind back. Remember that the pilots that were flying water bombers over the top of the, you know, so so it, and it, when an explosion happens in a nuclear power plant, people think it's the uranium that's exploded. It's usually the cooling system. That's yep. exploded. Something's gone over pressure. So pressure valve has failed. Something's happened, and a pipe goes bang, or a boiler goes bang, or something goes bang. Uh, and was, I think in Fukushima it was actually a hydrogen explosion. I think it was. Well, I, so actually, I think because it overheated, um, it produced hydrogen. I'm pretty sure, and that then went out and blew the tops yep. on each of them. And we were, we had in the media they were talking about how these pilots were heroes because the skin was going to melt off their face because of the radiation exposure and mm. they were going to die these horrible awful deaths within just a few days. Of course, none of that ever ever happened. And one person was killed in the explosion at Fukushima. I have read and, and estimates varied, but I have read numbers in excess of two thousand individuals being killed during the evacuation because of the fear. Yeah, well, I, I don't know about that, but what would certainly be the case is all those displaced people who've lived in Fukushima and the, the general vicinity, all the old people who wanted to while away their days on the veranda in a rocking chair have mm. now been taken out to somewhere else mm -hmm. and they're just going to give up because they've been taken away from their home. It, yeah. it just was yeah. a silly thing to do. But And the crazy thing is we, 
it's well known that those radiation safety limits are ridiculously conservative. We know that because radiation, you know, the, the people who use radiation to kill cancer, they yeah. know exactly what the levels are um, and the two don't don't match up. Mm. Well, the, the other thing that you mentioned there was the, the number of people killed uh, by Fukushima. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, the final UN nuclear energy agency's atomic energy agency report put the number, if my memory serves me correctly, at 86 total deaths. Yeah. It, yeah, that's right. Sorry, I've got a, a call. Somebody's trying to get a call through. It, so, uh, no, I've got to right. try to stop this um, right, no, call. All good. Maybe I can um, do that. So, so from my point of view, I mean, if I hadn't read the report myself and someone said that to me, I would instantly assume that person had no idea what they were talking about because popular yeah. culture has told me yep. that that um, um, Chernobyl was this massive disaster and thousands of people died of radiation and running and screaming and bodies catching on fire just from the intensity of the energy and like all sorts of crazy in hindsight cartoonish ideas but during the 60s and 70s we had movies like the china syndrome and you know a lot of sort of popular culture was really going hard on this idea that nuclear equaled death for us all but you see even here i would blame the scientific institutions um that right. if you look at the way they developed the uh the nuclear safety regulations which is uh, where they use this um, as low as reasonably possible. I think that's what they call it. Right. Rather than, so you just screw down the levels as, as far as you can because you, you can, right? Not because it actually, yeah. Yeah, uh, you don't actually look at the the sort of epidemiological effect of it. Yeah. So we did that in the 1950s and we made them ridiculously low. And then we've pretended yeah. ever since. And we also use this thing called the linear no threshold hypothesis where where we um we pretend that, brought that up. yeah i mean it's a crazy thing i mean if yeah. the linear no threshold hypothesis worked um on other things like taking a panadol I, I don't know how many panadol you have to take to kill you but let's say it's 20. Mm. the linear no threshold hypothesis would mean that one in 20 people would die from, from taking one panadol right? yeah. yeah or yeah. we know <laughs> that if you if you drain eight pints of blood out of me i die Therefore, if you dry one pint out of me, I have a 12.5% chance of dying. That yeah. is the ridiculous, crazy science which we use in nuclear regulations. And that's one of the reasons why we got this crazy uh, situation. Okay, so there's a lot of people who wouldn't be familiar with a, a, a linear no, thresh, uh, no threshold hypothesis. But essentially, and feel free to correct me if I get this wrong, because this, this is something I read about a long time ago and I haven't been across more recently. It essentially means that there is no safe threshold, the no threshold idea, all exposure is harmful in varying degrees. Yep. And that the harm is linear. If you double your exposure, you double the likelihood of harm. That that is that, is that a reasonable... That's exactly I mean? it. So I use, I use the example, I have eight pints of blood. If you drain eight pints out of me, 100% certainty I will die. Mm -hmm. It then says if I drain one pint of blood, one eighth, Mm -hmm. I've got a one in eight chance of dying. In other words, every yeah. blood bank, there should be one in eight people should be falling over yeah. out the door. That's so, the linear no threshold hypothesis. And it doesn't and, work, right? Well, it, it, it works in some areas of, uh, in, with some substances and some interactions with the human body is my understanding. Um, but but uh, no, I, I, I don't believe it works in any way, very shape few, or form. Uh, it, it actually yeah. works with very few that there's a, there is a, you know, there is a safe level for most things, right? Yeah. Yes, there may be something. Well, there, yeah, I mean, no. some things perhaps there aren't, but for most things, for almost all drugs, yeah, you know, there, there is a, a safe level. So I, where I came across this idea of the no, uh, no threshold linear, um, the hypothesis was actually in a study where they found that they were they were using mice, as a lot of studies do, and they found that mice that were given a certain dose of radiation low but above background lived longer than any other cohort they lived longer than the control group that was only getting background and they lived longer than the high dose radiation cohorts that actually there was an argument based on their data to say that more radiation than what we are currently exposed to is likely to actually lead to better outcomes now you'd want to do a lot more research before everyone ran around with a lump of uranium in their pocket um, but it's interesting to me. I mean, it just completely blows up this idea that there is no safe threshold. 
Well, that's true. I mean, you'd certainly want to check that, and that's a peer-reviewed paper, so there's a 50% chance it's wrong. Okay. Yeah, I ain't volunteering uh, I ain't volunteering for anything other than the control group. Thank you very much. Well, that, that's right. I mean, um, I can tell you a story. I've got a great auntie who in the 1920s worked in an X-ray. Um, oh, wow. Uh, a very early X-ray thing, and they thought this was really funny. They could, they could because... There must have been some like they'd actually do these things where they put shadows up and and play around with yeah. the X-rays. And anyway, yeah. I've forgotten the name of the auntie, but anyway, they, this great auntie, all of her hair fell out <laughs> because they'd been playing around with X-rays for too much. Yeah. She lived until she was something like eighty. You know, it didn't knock her over. So yeah. I mean, obviously, that's a stupid thing to do, and we'd never do that yeah. now. But it's not yeah. like radiation is an unknown thing uh, that you know that, that a small amount can kill you. Yes, you can be killed by it. There's no doubt about it. But the fear yes. of it is more of a problem at the moment. Yeah. All right. So that's nuclear. We've solved one of the world's problems. Um, let's 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 keep. We're on. We're on a roll. We're on to a good thing here. Let's solve a few more of the world's problems. There is there is this really interesting sort of cultural thing going on. And you, as someone who's been teaching the next generation of scientists and and interacting with them, I'd be very curious to get your take on this. Every generation seems to have a really dim view of the next generation. Uh, you know, and this seems to have been true certainly for the last few generations. Um, yeah. And I hear a lot of, you know, oh, you know, millennials are lazy or gen whatever the current gen whatever is. Um, you know, they're all just SJWs and what have you. I'm finding, I mean, I live in the outer southeast of Melbourne and I'm surrounded mostly by younger people than myself uh, where we're in a pretty new housing area. There's a lot of young families, young couples, et cetera. Uh, and I'm looking around going, these people are working bloody hard. They've gone and gotten themselves a trade, mostly tradies, working bloody hard, making the world a better place, building things, etc. Now, you, of course, work in a very different area to the trades. You're in, you're in the sciences. Do you give any credence to this kind of apocalyptic view that we're all doomed because the next generation is so stupid and lazy and everything else? Or, or, or have you seen something different to that? Uh, well, I have seen something different. And I actually place all my hope in the younger generation Mm. After all, it's my generation and one eye either side of it that's got ourselves into this pickle, isn't it? So we, we're not exactly uh, virtue, <laughs> virtuous. We're here. not blameless, are we? <laughs> no, no, we aren't. And um, I'll tell you a story. While I, just before I was finally fired, um, so I, I had a lab and a lot of, because of the reductions in the size of the university, a lot of the scientists had left. And I invited all the, the first year uh, physics students uh, into my lab so they can work out, you know, basically use it as an area during the day. And we, there was a lot of, lot of them in there all the time. And just before I was fired, a couple of these guys came in. They said to me, Peter, you need to watch this guy called Jordan Peterson. And I said, ah. who's he, right? Because yeah. Yeah. the funny thing was the day before, my mother had said, you got to watch this guy called Jordan Peterson. So I thought <laughs> I should watch this guy called Jordan Peterson, obviously. But yeah. they explained it. And it was very interesting that, Yes, this generation has been utterly brainwashed by our evil generation, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they have not, to their credit, totally lost their ability to think. Uh, so don't give up on the younger generation. If anybody's going to save us, they're the ones who are going to save us. That's why I'm running this thing called Reef Rebels. Right? I want we're mm. taking young people out to the reef. I'm not interested in talking to old people anymore. I want to talk to mm. sorry. I want to, sorry, guys, I want to talk to young people, right? Because when they, my hope, it's just a hope, uh, but I think it will happen. Mm. When this generation realise that for their whole life, their whole 30 years or 20 years, they have been utterly brainwashed about things like climate change, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like the Great Barrier Reef, which is now at record high coral cover, they're mm. going to say, this is really not very good at all, is it? And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they will rebel. So that's where it's going to come from. Don't give up on them. We need to encourage them. It is fascinating to me now. You know, I, I was raised as a good Christian conservative. My dad was a pastor. I was, I, you know, we were politically conservative. We were religious, um, you know, and I, I had all of, the, all of the hallmarks of that upbringing and that, that worldview. And then I got to 38 years of age and all the COVID nonsense came along and I became one of the sort of the four, at the forefront of breaking those bad laws and standing up against what was going on. And now this is kind of what I'm known for. The previous 10 years of work on the Murray-Darling Basin, et cetera, has kind of disappeared into history. Everyone's forgotten about that. I'm now known as the the, the COVID lockdown guy. <sighs> anyway, um, 
you know, so it's it's been an interesting journey for me. And I think a lot of, you're absolutely right, a lot of young people are being raised one way. But that penny is going to drop. And the change is going to be very, very large and very, very fast. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that if if and when the change comes, we've just got to work under the under the assumption that it will come because we just yeah. have to, right? Um, it could happen incredibly quickly. It's sort of a Berlin Wall falling yeah. type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day yeah. it's there and the next day it isn't. And and people will be backing off and thinking, oh, I never said anything about climate change. You know, I was always <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's like uh, the more time went on, the higher the percentage of French people were in the French resistance. Yes. You know, they, they, yeah. In reality, it was a couple of percent. By the time you were 15 years after the war, it was nearly 50% of them had, had fought actively in the in the French resistance. Yeah, um, that, that, that's it, right. It's going to be the same thing with a lot of these things. But you do have to wonder, and I, and I don't want to kind of burst your, your bubble of hope regarding the impact that this data from the reef may have. But honestly, in the area of climate change, we've had you know, since 1998, we've had a very much sideways trend in terms of the Earth's overall average temperature. We have, you know, pretty much median uh, or or above median levels of ice coverage at the North Pole. South Pole, There, yes, there are one or two areas where it's losing uh, ice mass, but actually overall gaining ice mass. Greenland is gaining ice mass. We haven't seen an increase in cyclones. We haven't seen an increase in the rate of sea level rise. All of these predictions haven't come true, and yet it hasn't triggered that epiphany. It no, but this is, look, look, you're probably right that the record high coral cover won't have anywhere near as much effect as I'm hoping, right? Look, I, I hope I'm is, wrong. Please understand, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but I, I would argue that this is a much more significant figure. Imagine okay. if the next month that the, you know, that they add up all the temperature records of the whole world from the satellite data and all the rest of it, and we ended up with the lowest temperature that we'd ever recorded for 40 years. Yeah. That's what's happened on the Great Barrier Reef, right? Yeah. Yeah. The reef yeah. is supposed to be dying and we've had the highest ever. Yeah. That's a big deal. And of course, that's why the ABC yeah. are trying to bury it. They're trying to make out, oh, it's still bad news. I, I don't know whether you've seen some of the stuff on the ABC. No, I haven't. Uh, I, I look, I sorry, I, I don't voluntarily drink poison and I don't voluntarily watch the ABC. Well, you know, the ABC and uh, are saying, well, yes, it's record high, but it's still bad because it's only the fast growing species that have grown back. And well, of course, it's the fast growing Where species. Those are the ones who are killed, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. You, know, <laughs> you just got to laugh at these people. And they just suck the joy out of life. They're even oh, a really yeah. good thing. Oh, it's still bad. <sighs> just. Look, you know, you know, you make a really good point. They suck the joy out of life. I'm, I'm involved with obviously a lot of amazing people down here in Melbourne who were a part of the pushback against the lockdowns during COVID, et cetera. That really has very much dominated my life for the last two and a half years. Still does. Impacted my mental health greatly. Impacted my physical yeah. health. Uh, impacted my family, my, my um, economic situation, everything. There's not an area of life that wasn't touched by that. Uh, and that's true of, of many Victorians. So that's that's really dominated my life. And I'm working with a lot of the people that I've met. I mean, the silver lining is the people I've met through this have just been phenomenal people. Yeah. Uh, and I've made lifelong friendships as a result of sort of being on the front lines together. But what we're focused on now is, is what we've realized is the life of those people that are being sucked in by all of this stuff is going to be miserable. And what we actually need to do more than anything else is live lives of joy and happiness and friendship and fellowship and actually show them a, a a better way, not in terms of the data, but they can actually just look at us and go, I wish I was them. They're having fun. Well, maybe, maybe you're right. I don't know how you do that. Uh, you don't know how you have fun? But, uh, well, well no, 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 I don't know how you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, so I don't know how you you show them that side of things. But I, but I do mm. think it's very important that you try not to get too angry with people on the other side. Yeah. Um, that if you want to bring somebody across, um, you've got to do it very gently. Uh, and to be of good cheer, a bit like Nigel Farrar, you know, the cheerful warrior. Um, mm -hmm. he, he really mm -hmm. does it very well. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I'll be, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing him at CPAC uh, when he mm. comes to CPAC Australia. Um, yeah. Shameless plug, October 1st and 2nd. You need to be there. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it is. It's it's this really interesting thing. And I, I'm 
what I'm observing, and we're getting we're right away from the science now. We're into I don't know sociology and and philosophy and whatever else. Who knows? But anyway, um, there's almost this rise of the new Puritans. Have you ever seen that photo of the Prohibition era women? A whole bunch of women lined up, you know, some sitting down, some standing behind them, and I think the caption was "Men whose lips have touched alcohol will never touch ours," right? <laughs> and they are the most sour dour, depressing looking group that you could possibly imagine. And it's it, it it's not it's not a good advertisement for prohibition and for not drinking alcohol. And I always feel like the same thing is happening now when you look particularly at the extreme progressives. Um, you know, these these people that really want to just detach us all from any form of reality, the you know, the pronoun brigade, the whole gender fluidity brigade, all of that stuff. And I find I look at them and I go, you're a terrible advertisement for your worldview. You, you know, this is not enticing at all to to no like me. And of course, remember that ended all that prohibition stuff ended. I mean, um, my wife had an aunt who um, she, you know, back in the 1940s, a lot of people would sign these pledges that they were never going to drink alcohol and all mm -hmm. this type of stuff, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that, all that's passed. So mm -hmm. this is why we've got to that Puritanism um, really, I mean, it's, it's come and it's gone on, on other things and it's here mm. now. And that's why we should have hope that it is going to go sooner or later mm. because people mm. just have enough of it. Well, I, Because one of, one of the things about the, often with the Puritans is their hypocrisy mm, uh, mm. and the hypocrisy of, of a lot of the modern left uh, you know, it, it's just so obvious. Well, I, I have a saying, and apologies to those who are watching that have heard me bang on about this before, but we're familiar with two different sayings. We're familiar with the idea that the revolution always eats its own, right? A revolution gets enough steam, it, it eventually it starts eating its own. But also the, a, a culture always breeds its own counterculture, right? The minute something becomes the established prevailing culture, from that moment, the counterculture is already brewing and it's it's inexorable. It's, it cannot be stopped. Yep. And I have a theory that when you see both of those things happening at the same time, the revolution eating its own and the counterculture gaining momentum against the prevailing culture, then you're on the cusp of a major sociological shift. And I think that's where we're at right now. This is this is just my opinion. But you look at the the this whole sort of sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s has come into this cultural revolution that we're seeing now, and it is very much eating its own. The feminist heroes of the 80s and 90s are now being dismissed and sidelined, etc. Uh, you know, the J.K. Rowlings of this world, heroes not long ago, Martina Navratilova, Helen Caldicott. Yeah. I mean, it's a long list of people that were heroes in their time that are now being eaten by their own revolution. Yeah. But also what we're seeing is the... the, the um, Culture is breeding its own counterculture. We have this ever strengthening grip over governments and institutions, etc., of the pronoun brigade, brigade etc. But look at what's happening in comedy. We've mm. now got this underground counterculture that is that has become uncancelable. They've tried. The Ricky Gervais of this world, the Chris Rocks yeah. of this world, have become uncancelable. They're no longer able to be squashed by the prevailing culture. That means the counterculture is doing this. And I, I believe we're on the cusp of actually a rapid, enormous... Yeah, Jermaine Greer, thank you. That was I was actually searching in my mind for that name and I couldn't quite come up with it. So thank you, Mama. Um, you know, I actually think we're watching this happen. The revolution is eating its own and the culture that has bred a new counterculture that has grown to the point that it cannot be stopped. And I think we're on the cusp. I don't know what the change looks like. I don't know what we become, but it's a big change. I, I, I think you're probably right. I mean, we're going to we're going to find out. I mean, I've been predicting. But the trouble is, I've been sort of been predicting this for quite a while. But this time, I sure. think we're really right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like climate change, you know. The world yeah, yeah. Next right, year, right. but this time, we're point. right. <laughs> oh dear, so true. Well, look, tonight has been an absolute pleasure. This has been a thrill for me. I, I've wanted to interview you for a very long time. What I want to do before before we end tonight, um, I'm I'm actually going to say, hey, everyone watching, if you've got questions, comments, etc., uh, for I'm I'm going to call you professor because in my mind, you've earned that title and you will have it till the day you die. Uh, if you've got questions or comments for Professor Peter Ridd, um, then now's the time to jump in. Let's let's keep a good thing going. 
Uh, but I'm also mindful, uh, Peter, that you did say you, you you tend to be your best up until about ten o'clock. So I don't want to yeah, I don't want to stretch too past <laughs> far that point, too far past that point. So um, if you've got questions, if you want to if you want to go down another rabbit hole or two, now's the time to jump in uh, with your questions, etc. And uh, and we'll have a bit of fun with that in the next twenty minutes or so before we before we wrap it up. But from my point of view, Peter, one of the things that I'm very, very interested in with people like yourself, where you've achieved so much, but your career has been cut short and you've you've got a lot of years left in you, we all hope. You've got a lot left that you could do. What is it that, where does your head go? And you go, right, that door is closed. The whole university thing, that's done. Now I'm into this. What What's this for you? What's the thing that you're now investing your time in? Uh, science quality assurance that's what I do okay. uh, and I do it for nothing so I, I'm with the Institute of Public Affairs I'm an adjunct yeah. uh, I'm not paid I insisted that I wouldn't be paid because one of my problems is that I get criticized I'm in the pay of the sugar industry or the coal industry or some other industry and it's very mm. very useful for me to say no I'm not <laughs> never I, I was at <laughs> university I only took money from the university even though we did a lot of commercial work for the university uh, sure. And now I don't take any money from other people either. So I, you know, I can push these things like this record high coral cover. We're working on this reef rebel programs with the IPA. So uh, I, is, this is relevant. He, I, this question just popped up. Where can we access reef rebels? Someone who's heard you mention it and wants to know more about it. Where do they go? Um, well, we've only just started. If you if you Google Institute of Public Affairs Reef Rebels, you should be able to uh, find it yep. there, there yep. somewhere. Okay. So what this is about is it's taking young people out to the reef. Because, you see, I've, I'm a firm believer if, if you want to convince somebody that the reef is fine, just take them out there, show them a bit of data, and they'll come round, right? Yep. But you yep. need to do that. And our idea is with luck, and I don't know how this is going to go, we're going to slowly build up a nucleus of, you know, first half a dozen and then mm. more and more people, more and more young people, all young people. Mm. And the idea is to get them scientifically literate about the reef so they can carry out a, a debate on this and spread the word and help mm. just strike that match of the revolution mm. uh, ahead. So that's what Reef Rebels is about. And it's called Reef it. Rebels for a very good reason because this is what we – and that we just had the first one. We, we had a really good time. Uh, a really great bunch of, of people. We're going to make a video of their journey um, with us. So we went them out to two reefs. Both supposedly have been massively bleached earlier this mm -hmm. year. And, of course, what did we find? <laughs> Wonderful coral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have, we've got a couple of questions coming in, and I, I want to get these to you pretty quick fire. Um, these are all questions without notice. You have every right to say, no, thanks, I'm not going to answer. Uh, does Peter know about the the coming predictions on the possible cooling due to the coming grand solar minimum? Uh, if we begin cooling, then the climate change scam could be over. You're nodding your head as though you've heard of it. What are your What are yeah. your thoughts on this? Look, it could happen, but I actually regard that because they're modelling the sun, and yeah. I look at modelling of the sun. I think that's probably not quite as hard as modelling the climate, but it's not that much um, more, not, not much uh, simpler. So. Yes, okay. it could happen, but I wouldn't be banking on it. Uh, okay. We certainly should be worrying about cooling, though. Cooling's yeah. much, 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 much more damaging. I worry about mm. volcanic cooling, a big nuclear, yeah. a big um, yeah. volcanic a, a eruption like 1850. Or a Pinatubo or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Well, much okay. bigger than that. Mm. Yeah. They have been uh, a couple hundred years. So, dear Professor, can you please talk about following genuine science and how people can best, or I'm going to say how lay people, people like me yeah. and, and Emily and others, how do we navigate this mess and try and discern what might be genuine and what, what might not? Look, that's a, that's a really good question. How do you tell whether you're being, um, you know, basically a sold a con? Mm. Um, well, you've got to look to things like, are they closing down opposition? As soon as you see that, then you know that, that there's a good likelihood there's a con. Not necessarily, not necessarily, but it's a, it's a good idea. Look to see whether the work has been massively replicated, right? Has it been done again and again and again? And do they keep on getting uh, the same results? Look to see whether there's, um, you know, appeals to authority. Yes. Um, okay. Argumentum, what is it, uh, uh, by authority. Uh, those yeah, are the uh, sorts of ideas. If you see that, then you know yeah. uh, there is a problem. But unfortunately, the reality is that for the layman, you're 
almost never going to know for sure that ultimately the layman yeah. needs to be able to trust the institutions and you can't. Yeah. So you're really in a very, very difficult position. And that's why we've got to get to the point where, look, institution, we know you make mistakes occasionally. Yeah. Um, but by and large, we trust you. When you do make mistakes, you own up to it. Uh, yeah. And we'll forgive you for that. No problems at all. But yep. at the moment, a lot of these institutions don't own up for their mistakes. They are utterly corrupted and yeah. they may well be right on many things. But how can you tell? Because they're untrustworthy. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so here's an interesting one. And this is this. I'm really agnostic on this. Uh, and again, you have the full right to say, you know what, pass. Uh, so how much does the cloud seeding affect the so-called climate change? Now, let's set the parameters on this. We do know that cloud seeding happens. This is, it's a publicly announced thing. We have schedules being released by government saying, yes, we're putting up planes. They're doing this amount of tons of this thing over these areas and blah, blah, blah. It happens. We know that for a fact. I've heard a lot of people making a lot of noise about the fact that the floods in Lismore were because of cloud seeding and various things like that. I, I find that personally very hard to agree with because we're not even seeing record levels of flooding. Historically, we've seen bigger floods. We don't need no. that. But I, 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 to what I don't think do you have an impact. Um, look, on rainfall, it's fairly debatable that cloud seeding does almost anything at all, actually. Really? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't see it as a problem there. In terms of, um, I mean, there's a lot of um, aircraft contrails, which is a form sure. of cloud seeding because of the sure. small elements of carbon in there. They do actually have a, you know, a small effect on the reflection of, of sunlight, uh, sure. probably largely to cool, I'd say. Look, mm. it's, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, yeah. Not yeah, I, I, with a lot of the other factors. Mm. I, I find it very hard to get excited about Sue as well. I'm, mm. I, you know, I'm not an expert by any means. I'm not any discipline of scientist. So take my word with a very big grain of salt. But I've, I've tried to look at, it and I just can't get excited about cloud seeding and, and whether that's having some big impact. I just, I just can't see it. Um, so anyway, we'll uh, we'll leave that one alone. Uh, I've got a lot of people making comments about you know the the veracity of science and how do we know that we can trust it, etc. But you've kind of you've kind of covered that. Um, I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a hard thing um, to actually... Well, you cancel. can't. You, you, you're actually just, you, at the moment, you can't. And that's a very sad state of affairs. Yeah. You can in some areas, um, in many areas of physics and engineering, you can. Yeah. Uh, anything where there's a little bit of ideology, yeah. no chance. Yeah. So let's let's wrap up on this then, Peter. A free kick for you. What would you, I mean, you, you're you're aware, obviously, of the amount of, I'm going to call it propaganda, it's an overused word, but I think it's valid in this case, around environmental sciences and the, the scare stories that we're sold and the doomsday predictions. I mean, in a, in a very real sense, environmental sciences are just a modern doomsday cult. I know they're my words, not yours, but that's, in my opinion, that's, that's that, how that, I see. That's exactly what they are. I, I completely mm. agree with you. That's exactly so what would your parting words be then to, to me and to everyone watching um, to how do we navigate a world in which that's happening, where we're trying to raise kids, have families, run businesses, have something resembling a satisfying, successful life in a world where that amount of propaganda is going on, et cetera. Is there, is there any parting wisdom or parting uh, thoughts that you want to leave with us before we wrap it up? I just keep on saying the words quality assurance because that ultimately mm. in science, right? So that, that many of our problems are because our scientific institutions have been corrupted and then that, that rattles down the chain and the ideology can then make use of that. It's not all the problems. It doesn't solve, the, you know, a lot of the wokeness, but it's a lot. It's, it's the, the fundamental problem behind the reef, the Murray-Darling, climate change mm. and other things. And mm. it is ultimately a quality assurance problem. Now, don't go along arguing, oh, well, necessarily the reef is fine or climate change isn't a thing or the Murray-Darling is fine. Mm. Just say, well, there's all these things here which you know, they don't totally add up. Maybe we should just do a little bit more quality assurance. And who can argue with that? Sure. And, and that's been my approach for the last four to five years. You just keep on saying those words, quality assurance. All right. I'm going to throw one more thing at you because we've got a great question here from Frost231. This will be the last one, and then we're going to wrap up. I'm a uni student in my undergrad in engineering. What advice do you have for someone like me? Well, you've got a bright future in engineering. I used to teach a lot of engineers, and uh, you'll be fine. Um, well, the, the advice, <laughs> 
my advice is that when the revolution comes, make sure you come out. If you feel really brave, you know, join us in the revolution because we old people need young people like you. You know, for example, I'm after a person to help me with my videos as a front young person for my videos. Right? Yeah. Um, because if I want to get to young people and, and spread the word, they don't want to look at a grey gray haired old fellow like me. They want to look at somebody who's more interesting. Mm. You might not be able to do that. You might not be in that position. You might not have the personality, of course. Um, but be ready when the revolution occurs to stick your head up above the parapet. Mm. Despite what they say, the revolution will most certainly be televised uh, on the internet, if not on, on broadcast television. Peter, this has been a thrill. Thank you so much. You've been very, very generous with your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. I know that everyone watching has loved it with the comments that have come through, etc. So if someone wants to follow your work, I know you mentioned that you've got a website that's coming in a week or so. Yeah. What's, how could someone keep following you? Um, well, I have a Facebook page. It's the Dr. Peter Reed Facebook page. Okay. And there's a website called Plato, as in the Greek philosopher, GBR, mm -hmm. platogbr.com.au. And uh, I put a lot, I'm putting a lot of information up on the reef, uh, which is sort of following my book. <laughs> reef heresy. Yes, I meant to mention this. Reef heresy. Reef heresy. And uh, nobody reads books anymore, so... Uh, <laughs> Most of that information will, will effectively be up on the web as well. But it's good to write a book just to for the sort of the regimen of getting your yeah. ideas together. Organising your thoughts. You, you should read the book as a uh, as a podcast. People do that. Uh, I've just yeah. put the platogbr.com.au website into all of the different pages and places where people are watching. Uh, so just click on that link. And um, I, I think Peter said to me earlier that he's probably a week away from having that up. So maybe just save it's, that link. It's going. It's going. Uh, it's just I haven't populated. I'm about halfway yeah, okay. there. All right. Um, so, guys, just be patient. Um, and, and in a week or two weeks or whenever it happens, you're going to find uh, that Peter is going to be putting up some really, really, really fantastic content there where you're going to be able to stay across all of what's happening. Peter, thank you, not just for tonight, but for all that you've done. Uh, for having the courage to actually speak up for what's true and what's right in spite of the personal cost. There are far too few people like you in the world. And I'm very, very grateful. And I feel it's been my privilege to speak with you tonight. So thank you. Well, I feel like I'm brothers in arms with you, with your uh, travails too. So I wish you luck with those. Yeah, look, thank you. And obviously, uh, everyone, you'll be kept up to date as we go along. I am just going to throw in a Topher Field Dot net as well. You need to go there, go to the very top blog post and book in for your tickets if you want to be there at one of the cinema showings of Battleground Melbourne. You can watch it for free at battlegroundmelbourne.com. You don't have to pay money to watch Battleground Melbourne. You can watch it for free. It was crowdfunded, funded by you guys, and it will always be available to watch for free. But if you want to be in a cinema with a bunch of like-minded people and uh, go on that journey together, uh, and I'll be there as well at every single one of the showings, then you need to go to tofafield.net, go to the very top blog post. It has all the dates and all of the booking links. Peter, thank you very much. You're an absolute champion. Tonight has been a pleasure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night, and I'm sure we will talk again at some point in the future. hope so. Thanks very much.